It's been a joy to be with you this week, and I thank you for your kind attention, and, and uh, there have been encouraging words, and uh, uh, we trust that the Lord will use this hour. Would you join me in your Bible, please, by turning to the book of Psalms, and to two different chapters in the book of Psalms. First in Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 17, Psalm 17, and since you have two hands, you can put one hand there and go back to Psalm 119. So that is Psalm 17 and Psalm 119. We obviously are going to be looking again on why I believe the Bible. And if I wasn't clear yesterday, and apparently I wasn't, this is a part two. The pamphlets that were stolen from me last yesterday, it contained both messages in one. So if you picked one up, you got both messages. And uh, we are continuing in this. And I think when we look at our notes, I think I have 10 reasons that I centered in on as to why I am convinced that the Word of God is indeed to be believed. Psalm chapter 17. And uh, um, verse 4. Psalm 17 and verse 4 says... Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. And what I want you to see there is that there is a destroyer out to destroy your faith and to destroy your faith in your Bible and destroy your faith in God and destroy your walk in God. David said, by God's word, that had not happened with him. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And we begin reading in verse 42. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. Now we're going to pick up there in a moment. But I want to share to you that I know that there is a battle coming for every one of us in regard to the integrity of God's Word and believing it. Someone is going to come across our path that is going to seek to try to cast doubt on the integrity and the reliability and the authority of God's Word. And especially if you are under the age of 30, I suspect, and you still are going to different institutions of learning, you are going to constantly feel like you are in this battle. Don't give up the warfare. Amen. Don't give up an inch. The Bible that God has provided for you in your hand is worthy of your absolute confidence because it is the absolute final authority from God and it's worth our confidence. Amen. Let's go back and read that verse Again, Psalm 119, verse 42 says, So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me. Read it with me, class. For I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. I will walk at liberty. I will seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies. Before who, class? In other words, ashamed of nobody. Even if I stand in the presence of a king, I will talk of thy word. And if you can talk before a king who holds your, your life in his hand, we can certainly talk, to, certainly talk to our friends and our relatives and our professors. Amen. Amen. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. There was a man by the name of Bob who had really worked hard all week and Friday came and he decided that he was going to reward himself, so he decided to stay out the entire weekend and party with his friends. 
And in so doing, he spent his entire paycheck. Come Sunday evening, he decided to return home. And when he did, uh, his wife was um, waiting for him. <laughs> and for two hours, she gave him a tongue lashing that was befitting his actions over the weekend. She let him know what she thought about his actions. And after about two hours, she said, And how would you like it? if you didn't see me for two or three days. To which Bob's responds, I'd like that just fine. <laughs> so Monday morning came and he didn't see her at all. Tuesday morning came, he didn't see her at all. Wednesday morning came and he didn't see her at all. But by Thursday morning, he got up and went into the bathroom and his wife was standing behind him and he could begin, the swelling had gone down just enough he was able to see her out of the corner of his left eye. <laughs> now the point of sharing that with you <laughs> is that we Christians get beat up a lot, don't we? And, but I do want to share this especially with our young people that if you're getting beat up regularly in regard to your faith, maybe you're hanging around and spending too much time with the wrong people. That's right. Now I know you can't take yourself out of school, but we do, and we do need to be in the battle and defend our faith and to try to win the loss to Him. So uh, we're, we, we can't entirely escape that. But you know what? <laughs> we don't have to just be a whipping post for lost people who ridicule our faith and ridicule our Bible. And never ever let them beat us into submission to retreat back away from a solid, consistent stand in the confidence of believing in God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our Bible. Amen? Amen. Uh, by the way, I intentionally didn't do that. That's about what Bob looked like on... Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning. Now, as we go into the scriptures today, we want you to notice that we have solid answers to defend our faith and to defend the Bible. And yesterday, we looked at this subject about why I believe in the Bible. But let's review very quickly the high points of what we looked at last time together. One of the reasons why we should believe the Bible is because it claims to be the Word of God. Over and over again, it's called, the, the, the Scriptures say, Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord saith, or the Word of God saith. Two, it was given in a miraculous way. God inspired it. He breathed the inspiration and the power of God's Word onto every word on every printed page, on every pin stroke page. Number three, it was preserved in a miraculous way. God saw to it that the scribes counted every word on every page and were meticulous and careful in every stroke of their pen. Number four, we have thousands of corroborating manuscripts that tell us that we have a very consistent testimony in the record of God's word. Much, much, much more so than the, than the records of any ancient writer, bar none. And so if the lost would view the writings of Darwin or Shakespeare or Homer and not question them, they should never question the Bible because we have so many more manuscripts of those. And it was compiled in a miraculous way. God raised up a special group of men, Old Testament prophets, to be able to write, and record, and to recognize the Word of God. And in the New Testament, He raised up a separate temporary group of prophets, miraculously enabled to know what was God's Word, to verify what was God's Word, to exclude what was not God's Word, to the point where you and I have a canon that is complete and worthy of our confidence. It was compiled in a miraculous way. 
There weren't just a couple of people that sat down and made, you know, shall we have this, shall we? God directed the compilation of every book that you and I have in our Bible. So we, review, we uh, continue then this, this morning as we go down a few more reasons why we should believe our Bible. Number six, I believe the Bible because of its unique harmony. The Bible was written over 1,500, I think almost 1,600 years, over 40 generations, by over 40 authors of vastly different backgrounds and educations. And we looked at some of that last week. Remember Peter and some of the New Testament apostles? What was the response of others who knew them in their day but did not know Christ as Savior? They said they were unlearned and what kind of men? Ignorant men. They were written by different, on three different continents, in three different languages, and covered many controversial subjects. Yet despite all of this time and diversity, it means a con constant harmonious theme, such as God being the creator, a coming redeemer, man's sinful nature, man's need of redemption and justification and mercy from God. But it has a unique harmony that is just fantastic. It has a harmony that blends together like a wonderful quartet with all four men or women that are able to sing in unison. We all love good music, don't we? Uh, we've enjoyed some of the good music. Brother Dave, I enjoyed, I enjoyed hearing Brother Dave in our special music a few moments ago, didn't you? And I've heard Dave sing in a quartet. And if you've got four men that sing as well as he does, and their voices all blend together, man, you just want to say, wow, hallelujah, Amen. thank you, praise the Lord for that. I mean, that's just really fantastic. And God's Word blends together in harmony. Given the vastness of time and education and personalities and everything, the Bibles with its harmony could only have been done through divine intervention to put this together. Could we today put even 20 authors, not 40, but 20 authors together from the same generation, from the same place, with the same language, and get them to agree on only one controversial subject? What do you think the likelihoods of that would be, class? Yeah, zero. It's not very likely. Yet God was able to do so using the diversity of all the human writers in Scripture and yet give us the harmony and the consistency that we see in God's Word. And the reason is, is the Scriptures vibrate like a tuning fork with perfect harmony because the hand of God guided its writing and its composition and its preservation. We can believe the Bible. Because the only way to explain this perfect harmony and consistency and accuracy is to believe that it is what it says it is. It is the Word of God. The inspired, written Word of God. God's love letters to every human soul. The seventh reason why I believe the Bible is because it was written by eyewitnesses and two contemporaries who had knowledge of the events that they recorded. For instance, Peter wrote, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. I forget which speaker it was who brought up the subject and the definition of fables, but it was well done here earlier in the week. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Eyewitnesses saw him. It wasn't a hearsay by the second or third or fourth, fourth time around. They wrote what they saw. You can even go back and look up that word witnesses in Acts chapter 2 and they recount that for us again. Peter said that they were eyewitnesses, and indeed they were. Other biblical writers of Scripture use nearly the same language to inform their readers that what they wrote about 
was something that they had seen with their own eyes. John writes about it in 1 John. In Acts chapter 10, we read it. In Revelation chapter 1, again, the Apostle John. And here is an example. John says, whoops, excuse me. John says, that which we have seen, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, declare we unto you. Luke said some similar things, and you might want to read that in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. But it is even more compelling is that those to whom the authors of their day wrote scripture, that they were written to those people who were aware of the facts and were often witnesses of the very things that they wrote about themselves. When Moses wrote and recorded the Pentateuch, he wrote to the nation of Israel who had seen the parting of the Red Sea and the plagues of Egypt. When the Lord Jesus Christ was written about by the uh, in the gospel accounts it, and speaking about things of such as Lazarus being raised from the dead it was written to people who had seen and witnessed that those sorts of things and when the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ came it was similar and Peter says in Acts chapter 2 ye yourselves also know these things. Oh, Peter wasn't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, nor could he, because he was writing to contemporaries of his day who would have known if he was writing a falsehood. But they knew he was writing the truth. And the Apostle Paul told Festus in Acts chapter 26, these things that I've been telling you about, about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done in my life, and he's the Redeemer, that he's the fulfillment of prophecy, that he's the promised Messiah and King of the world. These things were or are not hidden, for these things were not done in a corner. Remember what they said? The detractors, the Jews who hated the Savior said, these people have turned the world what? upside down because they were giving testimony to what had done what had been done the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and many of the tombs were opened and they were seen of above 500 people at one time including many of the unsaved by the way I do have a sense of humor and God does too I'd love to have a video of people who saw the graves opened and people rising from the dead. And, well, and it's not like these idiotic shows they have in, on television today about the walking dead and it's zombies. No, these were people who were alive and healthy and vital. And you know what? I think it's just possible they might have been rejoicing and had smiles on their faces and were happy. I wonder if they were singing the Hallelujah Chorus when they came into town. I would have loved to have, I would have loved to have seen the responses of people who's Mom! Dad! Henry! Susan! I can't believe it! Wow! High witnesses saw these things. And if people would have been telling a lie about that, those lies would have never stood. Had their, wor had their words in the inspired scriptures been not true, it would have been known. Detractors would have created such, a, such an uproar that history would have recorded it. But the opposite is true. Even Christ's enemies could not deny the Savior and His miracles and what he had done. And nor could they find his body. And history confirms the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in spite of fierce opposition, the truth of the scriptures is so powerful that as it says in Acts chapter 17, it turned the world upside down. Because these testimonies of the scriptures were true. On November 17th, 
2013. Auburn defeated Georgia with a last second Hail Mary pass. <laughs> the ball bounced off the hands of the defender into the hands of an Auburn receiver who took it for a touchdown. 70,000 plus fans saw it in the stadium. Hundreds of thousands saw it on television and replays, and be also became eyewitnesses to what some announcers have called the most unbelievable play in college football history. Now I want you to think with me for a moment. By the way, have any of you ever been to a college football game? Has anybody ever heard of Ohio State? <laughs> Let's just place this for the moment in Ohio State. And we'll say that the University of Michigan, have you ever heard of the University of Michigan? That this was not Auburn and Georgia, but that this was Michigan and Ohio State. I've heard that the people in Ohio State kind of like their football team and they get avid about this. By the way, you ain't seen nothing if you ain't been in the South. And seen them in Georgia and LSU too because they love their football too. Can you imagine the uproar if Georgia had claimed, no, we've got the ball and we won the game. You know what would have happened? People have been coming out of the stands and they would have ripped those people in half. <laughs> there would have been dead bodies laying all over the field. And I'm not joking. And likewise, if people had been lying about the truths of the scriptures that were written to eyewitnesses and contemporaries of the day, those people would have been torn limb from limb, and I'm not exaggerating. They would have tied ropes around their arms and their legs and attached them to horses going in different directions and then whipped the horses. And by the way, many did, because of their faith, later die for their faith in believing in the truth, not any lies in our Bible. The seventh, or rather the eighth reason we want to share with you as to why I believe we should stand without faltering in our faith for the Bible is it because it is historically, consistently, historically accurate. And I want to say that again. It is consistently, historically accurate. And there are hundreds and hundreds of examples. But for the sake of time and attention span, I'm going to share just three with you today. And here's one, if I can get the clicker to work. Daniel chapter 5 records Belshazzar was the king of Babylon when it was conquered by the Medes and the Persians. For many years, secular history long recorded not... I'm not sure if I pronounced this correctly because that's not my strong point. Class is... Yes, that's who I thought it was. As the, as the last king of Babylon. In 1853, however, the biblical account was verified when a cylinder was unearthed showing that both of those men were co-rulers at the same time. Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus, however you pronounce that. I wish they would have just had names like Tom and John, Larry. <laughs> but some of these names are a little tongue twisters for me. And occupied the palace at the same time of the invasion by the Medes and the Persians. But once this cylinder was unlocked, secular history had to admit that the biblical account was accurate as it was recorded in Daniel. Well, imagine that. <laughs> a similar account is that of Sargon, whom the Bible refers to as the king of Assyria. Secular history scoffed in disbelief, thinking that this was only a fictional account. Ever hear that, class? Yeah. Until Sargon's palace was uncovered in the 1800s. And again, the biblical account was accurate while the secular, secular scholars were in error. By the way, dear ones, whenever man disagrees with the Bible, man is always in error. 
Whether we have the complete answers to be able to refute some theory or some idea or not yet have that answer, we can stand firm that God is always right. And there is one thing that God cannot do according to the Bible. What is that, class? He cannot lie. And this Bible is truth. There is not one lie. There is not one half-truth in it. It is all the truth. Amen. And you can stand on it without apology, without shame, without wavering. This is the truth. The greatness... The greatness and wealth of Solomon is described in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 26. But they were doubted by years from many historians. Those doubters began to waver when archaeologists discovered the, city, the chariot cities in Mid... Mid I'm having... My tongue is gonna, not working today. In the 20th century. And so here again, another instance of where the Bible was proved true. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful evidence over and over again to believe that the Bible is indeed true. Some things are lost in translation, they say. And in there is a family in Florida by the name of uh, Ramirez who was awarded $71 million by a court. They took their son, a couple uh, of Spanish descent who only spoke Spanish, took their son into an emergency room who was in great distress. And they tried to get him some help there. And they told him, uh, they, they told the hospital personnel there continually, in, in toxica, intoxicado, intoxicado. And they interpreted that even though they had people on staff that spoke Spanish, they took that to mean intoxicated. But here's the problem. Intoxicado does not mean intoxicated in Spanish. It means food poisoning. And as a result of not listening and not translating and not having their records correct, they gave the son, the wrong drug and the wrong treatment, and he became a quadriplegic. You know, the translation of things and the records of things are very important to be accurate. Critics of the Bible have seldom read the Bible or looked at the abundance of evidence that corroborates the accuracy of the Bible. And they carelessly level inaccurate actions about the Bible but they do so to their own peril because we have accurate records in our Bible and history and archaeology confirm it. That's not the entire thing that we rested upon. That's only one of the table legs supporting our faith. The ninth reason we look at is that the Bible is astounding in its scientific accuracy. Now think about this for a moment, please. In 1799, George Washington, the father of our country, died needlessly because he was bled for a cold. They cut him to bleed him out. Yet hundreds of years earlier, the biblical account proclaimed that that wasn't very wise. The Bible told them if they had known and followed their Bible. Leviticus says, chapter 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is where, class? In the blood. It is in the blood. And so if those physicians had been following the wisdom and the scientific knowledge of God's word, they would not have bled it. They might have given him a transfusion if that would have been possible in those days, but they certainly wouldn't have bled him. And this proved that the Bible is even scientifically correct. In divine wisdom, early in the history of Israel, and mankind for that matter, God required a quarantine for those with certain kinds of diseases. The Bible dictated that before society did. In Leviticus chapter 13, the scripture says, In all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean, he shall dwell alone. We would paraphrase that as what? <laughs> Quarantine. And so here again, God in his wisdom 
and the accuracy of the Bible talks about the scientific principle of health in quarantine. Long before Columbus or early explorers, God described the shape of the earth as round. The Bible says in Psalm, or rather Isaiah chapter 40, 22, that he sits above the circle of the earth and its people are as grasshoppers and he stretcheth out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. The circle of the earth. And that is certainly scientifically accurate. You might call the Bible ahead of its time. The Bible accurately describes the earth as being suspended in the universe by nothing. Job chapter 26 verse 7 says, He hangeth the earth upon nothing. There's no string holding the earth up. It is God's power that holds and sustains the earth. And he holds it by nothing other than his own power. Does that make sense, class? Amen. It's what God's word says. Scientists have recently discovered that the stars emit sounds just as the Bible says they do. In Job chapter 38 verse 7 it says, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Yeah, science has fairly recently learned that the stars emit sounds. And you know why? Even though the Bible is not a science book, when it talks about the natural world or anything that could be categorized as science, it is always accurate. Whether we realize it, whether we understand it or not, the Bible is always accurate. In the book, Preaching God's Word, Terry Carter relates a conversation with a former Navy diver who had experienced very deep dives. He told Terry that deep underwater that it is so dark that it is almost impossible not to become disoriented and confused. When you can't see your hand in front of your face, you can't determine which way is up and it can be very terrifying. So Terry asked, what do you do? What do you do when you can't determine which way is up or down. The Navy diver replied, feel the bubbles. The bubbles always drift to the surface. So when you can't trust your feelings. How many of you have a pet peeve? Oh, come on, now let's be honest. How many of you have a pet peeve? One of my pet peeves is and how do you feel about this? <laughs> I don't care how you feel about anything. And you shouldn't care how I feel about things. And you shouldn't care how other people feel about things, particularly when it comes into conflict with God's Word. You know what you and I should care about? What do you think about that? And better yet, what does God's Word say about that? <coughs> But getting back to the illustration, he says, when you can't trust your feelings, by the way, you can almost never trust your feelings or judgment. You can trust in the bubbles to get you back to the top. Now, the prejudice of men against the integrity of the Bible can have a disorienting effect on our faith. Don't trust your feelings. Or those who refuse to look at the evidence for the authority and the accuracy of our Bible. Follow the bubbles of truth that consistently prove that God's word is truth. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen to that. Follow the bubbles of evidence. The tenth reason that we look at, as we're drawing to a, to a close here pretty soon is because the predictions of prophecy have always come true. And that's significant. It's very significant. For me, this is one of the key things. God predicted the release of Israel from Egypt before it happened. And the destruction of many cities and nations throughout the Old Testament before it happened. Critics like to say, oh, 
that was history written after the fact. But carbon dating verifies the dates of these Old Testament books. And the same people who want to tell you that this world just evolved and carbon dating proves that, you've just knocked the props right out underneath their feet. If you're going to trust in carbon dating, you have to trust in carbon dating for the dates of our Old Testament books, which verify that prophecy was given and then later fulfilled. Does that make sense, class? Yeah, yeah. The Bible goes on with other prophecies, such as in Isaiah 7. It says, Behold, a virgin will be with child. Bethlehem, out of thee shall come the, the ruler of Israel, Micah 2. Kings would bring gifts to him, Psalm chapter 72. His escape to Egypt, Hosea chapter 11. And slaughter of the infants, Jeremiah 31. That Christ would be anointed for ministry when the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him, Isaiah chapter 11. Wow, there's a lot of coincidences going on here, isn't there? The time, the place, the matter, the reason of his birth were all foretold. So that Israel might believe, and Israel might believe their Bible. And that we might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we might believe our Bible. The Old Testament predicted Christ's betrayal by a friend in Psalm chapter 41. For 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah chapter 11. That money would be returned or thrown down in the house of God. Zechariah chapter 11. This was not a coincidence. It is proof, positive, that our Bible is what it claims to be. The authoritative written word of God. The final authority for what everyone ought to believe. Still not convinced? Isaiah chapter 35 says that he would be oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You know what most of us would do if people were driving nails into our wrists and our feet and beating us? We'd have a few choice words for them, wouldn't we? Not our Savior. Because he was born to die for my sins and then rise again. Isaiah chapter 50 foresaw the Lord Jesus Christ being spat upon. Psalm chapter 22 that he would be mocked. Isaiah 53 that he would be numbered with the transgressors. In Psalm chapter 22 that he would be pierced in his hands and his feet. Did any of those come true? Amen. Every single one of them. The only credible explanation for all of this fulfilled prophecy and much more than we've looked at this morning and that is documented here, is to believe that the Bible is the accurate, authoritative word of God. But do you know anybody like this? With this much evidence of, to support faith in the Bible, why do so many people fiercely oppose it? Have you ever wondered? Well, the Bible tells us some of the reasons why. <laughs> Remember we talked about earlier in 2 Peter chapter 3 that they are willingly ignorant? Stupid on purpose <laughs> or, or stubborn. Okay. It is also because according to John 3, 19, that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so they don't want to let loose of their sins and be accountable to God. And I'll tell you, I remember in the summer of 1971 when I heard the gospel for the first time entering my senior year in high school. And I knew that I needed to be saved. One of the questions that entered my mind and caused me to have pause was, I'm going to have to give up a lot of sinful things I'm doing. By the way, did I have to? No. Because God saved me in the depths of my sin the way it was. And then he gave me a different wanter inside. And so now I want it to be rid of those sins. I didn't have to be rid of those sins or turn over some new leaf in order to be saved. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. God saves you right where you are in the desperateness of all your needs. But men love darkness rather than light and they're afraid that they're going to have to give up their sin 
And so therefore, they resist the Lord and resist the, resist the Bible. I believe it's also oftentimes rebellion. Men do not want to retain the knowledge of God in their minds. There's just a rebellious spirit. You know anybody, unsaved person, that's just rebellious? Yep. Yeah, I do too. But we must also not forget that 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us that Satan blinds the eyes of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine forth unto them. There's a spiritual battle going on here in the minds of those who don't believe in God or the Lord Jesus Christ or the Bible. Satan is seeking to blind them and confuse them and to keep them convinced that what you and I believe in is hogwash. It isn't hogwash, it's heaven's washing made clean in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Columnist John Cass of the Chicago Tribune wrote about a waiter named Botch from Morocco. Botch was living in Chicago and wrote King Mohammed VI. And true to his reputation for loving his subjects, the king wrote back to Botch. The waiter, when John Cass, the columnist, came in, excitedly showed the letters to everyone who would listen, saying, Look! Look at the letters. These are letters from the king. If I meet him, I will be so happy. How can many claim to how can, how many can claim to receive letters from a king? <laughs> but this man could. But you know what? I can claim to receive letters from the king, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. In effect, our Bible is God's love letter for those of yesterday and those of today. And without hesitation, each one of us can place our faith unreservedly, unashamedly, uncompromising in the Bible. Have you placed your faith in the author of the Bible? Are you saved today? If you'd be in a car wreck leaving this building today, do you know for sure that you'll spend eternity in heaven? You can by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ's death as the payment for your sins, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the only way to be heaven. You can go to heaven. But dear ones, I'm wondering if I'm speaking to someone today who has been beaten up verbally for your faith in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in your Bible, and you've grown weary. You feel like your eyes and your ears and your hearts all swollen up with the bruises of being in a spiritual battle. Does that, talk, does that sound like you? And let's ask the Lord together today to give us the strength that we need, the power that we need, and to not shrink back from the battle. We need to be on the front lines, a soldier that does not retreat. And by the way, a metaphor for this book is the sword of the Spirit. You know, if you're a little boy, you like guns or maybe a plastic sword. You don't have a hollow spiritual sword. You've got a razor sharp sword that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And when you're Proving the case for the Bible. Make sure you're, you're quoting God's word that has the sharpness and the power to cut into the heart of that stubborn, rebellious individual. God's word will have more effect than anything else. Amen? Don't waver in your faith. Stand true to Him so that you might hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Let's bow in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you today that you have given us a Savior. We thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of us. We thank you that you've given us love letters in your Bible that are worthy of our trust and the Holy Spirit to be able to better understand them and then to better live them rightly divided. I pray for that one who might be here today who feel as though they've been beaten up by unsaved friends or relatives that you'd give them courage for the conflict that they're in. 
That you'd give them power from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That you'd help them to not be ashamed, but to, be, but to stand tall. And to realize that the foolishness of men does not matter. But to stand in the wisdom and the counsel of God. May we be victorious individually and collectively. May we be faithful, Father. Help us 